Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend, Rick from Blind, and I'm going to introduce you all to Christine Tao, who's the founder and CEO of Sounding Board. Before founding Sounding Board in 2016, she had several roles in Silicon Valley at Google, YouTube, Tapjoy, and other startups. In addition to advising several startups, Christine is an angel investor and a fellow at the Tory Burch Foundation. Sounding Board is a leader transformation company which offers a tech-driven, human-centric approach to leadership development with world-class leadership coaches and the most flexible software for delivering customized, measurable coaching and mentoring programs. Its award-winning dynamic leader development suite accelerates the growth of leaders at all levels and empowers organizations to thrive through disruption and change. Thanks for coming on the show, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I, I'm so struck by your background because, you know, you've held the executive roles, senior vice president, head of growth at these huge companies. You've built businesses from zero to a hundred million plus in just a few years. Very few people have done this. And so I want to take advantage of this opportunity. Can you walk us through your career and how you were able to get these milestones? Sure. I'd love to tell you it was all, you know, fully planned, but as we all know, it wasn't at all. When I think back, when you'd asked me this question and I thought about my career, I feel like I've sort of made more mistakes and stumbled my way into success than it was intentional. So I'll give you an example. I've managed to graduate both from undergrad and my MBA the worst possible times, like 2001 dot-com bus. Everybody was receiving offers. Nobody was hiring. It was the worst time to be looking for a job. And then 2008, I graduated from business school Right after what was, you know, I think it was deemed like the worst recession since the Great Depression. (laughs) And so um, similarly had um, gotten a job to go to Google and to YouTube, but then subsequently got laid off, you know, a a year post my MBA. Yet when you talk about the things I have accomplished, you wouldn't have known that that was part of my career journey or story. Um, But I do always like to share that because what I found if I looked back is that my career has sort of been marked with times where it seemed like it was the worst of times. And then what happens is after that, I ended up either landing into an opportunity that ended up being a pivotal shift in my career and something that led me down to the path to where I am today. Post the layoff from Google, I ended up going to a startup because that was one of the few places that were still hiring. And if you can think about that time, um, it was 2008. And I know now every single person has an iPhone or a mobile device, but not everybody did yet. Um, And I ended up landing at this company, Tapjoy, which was doing mobile advertising. We just caught this incredible wave as every user in the world started to buy a handheld mobile device. And then, of course, what did you do on your phone? You were playing with apps and you were playing games. So we were helping to monetize games and distribute apps. Now I tell people when I think about my career meeting I always really try to think about going where I feel like I'm learning. And if you can go into a place where the market is growing, the TAM for that, you know, product or solution is growing, everybody was going to be getting a mobile device. And those are the places where I really felt like you can have these step functions in terms of career acceleration. I often think about two themes, which is one You can be as intentional as you like, but sometimes you just end up landing into places that lead you down these like incredible paths by no design of your own. And so be open to those opportunities. Second, when you look at opportunities, think about what are growing markets and new ideas. We're right at the forefront now of AI coming into every single business and industry. And when those things grow, then your career grows. That's been my learning of my career. Lots of details I can fill in there, but just how I think about it when I look back at those, you know, last couple decades. I really appreciate that summary and that lesson because 
it, it's so easy to go on TechCrunch or Bloomberg or even Instagram, social media, and you don't realize that everything is seen through a filter, right? We're literally seeing the highlight reels. Yeah. Very few people are actually posting, oh, this is how my startup failed, which is, you know, why Jack and I, we love doing this podcast because we're able to like dig deeper, uncover those detours in that kind of career jungle gym, as so many of the guests have put it, when you look through your career, you're, you've been quite candid about how you feel like you've had gaps in leadership development skills along the way. How did you come to this realization? And, and what was that kind of epiphany like? Oh, boy, I think um, a lot of it is actually just learning on the job. You know, and it's like you said, people see where you are now and they forget that I wasn't always this way, right? And you weren't always this way. And we actually had to experience a lot of things to get to where we are and why I behave the way I do, why I show up the way I do. You know, I've, I've had things that have tested my confidence that have tested my metal. I wouldn't be where I am today without all of those ups and downs. Um, and I think the thing that has been super helpful for me really helped me up level, especially when I navigated moving into the executive ranks for the first time was leadership coaching and coaching. Um, but prior to that, when I was earlier in career, it was actually finding right mentors, right folks that would give me the feedback I needed at the right times to know how I was being perceived and whether or not that was working for me or what that might be putting out there for others to see and judge and be influenced by. It's just hard to see those things yourself when you're in it. Having that outside external perspective is huge, you know, and I've gotten that from lots of people across my career. My former CEO telling me some very candid feedback about how I was engaging with him around issues that we were running into as a business. His feedback to me was like, Christine, it feels like you just come and dump all your problems on me. And in my mind, I had been the one person that was telling him how things really were, right? Like, I'm the only person that actually knows what's really going on here. But you don't realize that how you communicate that matters, how you engage people around that matters. And that was something my coach worked a lot with me. Earlier in career, I had a lot of perceptions that I just had to put my head down and do the work. If I just do the work, People will see it. And, you know, Rick, you're also an Asian American. So I do feel like this is a bit having to do with like Asian and Chinese culture, which I was brought up in, which was to work hard. And I had a few lessons in my life earlier. I knew I put forth the best effort. I was driving results that others had. And yet I wasn't getting the recognition for that, that I would expect to. And having somebody be able to talk to me about that, I had mentors come and tell me, well, yes, you are doing good work. But how are you engaging your manager around that work? Is it aligned with what your manager is expecting or wanting out of you? And realizing that there is disconnects, those are some of the lessons I learned early on. And I did have a few setbacks, like I said, right? Graduating, not being able to find a job, getting a job and getting laid off. I think all of those things really contributed to me having a more open mindset about what are the things I need to solve to be successful and having this approach of really always trying to seek those perspectives to help me grow like faster in my career. It's so interesting, you know, you say that because I see this play out all the time where you have the people who are heads down grinding it away, doing great work, but they don't tout themselves. They don't brag. Where you have another type of cohort, they spend more time trying to sell themselves to senior execs and show what I'm doing, even if they're not doing anything, always trying to do, you know, show, look at me, look at me, look at me. And they may not be as smart and capable as the ones who are heads down doing the work, but they get, I think, in my own lived experiences, they're the ones who get the promotions and get the higher titles and they get recruited away because people tend to know who they are. Whereas the, the way you self-described yourself, you know, that like uh, you're doing the work, no one is, you know, no one is like uplifting you and say, hey, look what Christine is doing. This is how hard, you know, she's working and this is why she get promoted. And that's right. And that's a weird dynamic that goes on. I, you know, well, so you but see I, that but too, he, right? Yeah, but Jack, I think here's the thing mm -hmm. is like, you even have described it as two camps, right? Okay. Like, oh, I'm in the camp. Like I work hard and look <laughs> yeah. at people over there. They just like talk about what they do. 
And I actually have thought about this quite deeply. The challenge is, is that each side thinks that they're going about it the right way when actually the right way is somewhere in the middle. Because if you're working really hard, nobody knows what you're doing. How would they know that you are doing all of that work, right? You have to actually shift the mindset that that is negative, which I think even I had that same thought when I was early on, right? People should just know, right? Like talking about it, they should just know that I'm doing all the work. But what, you know, what I've had to realize is that actually, especially as you progress in your career, talking about and engaging others around the work you're doing and the impact that it's having is part of your work, right? And if you can get to that mindset where it's not, oh, those are the people that are just out there talking about themselves, not doing anything, or me, I am the one that actually does the work. It's actually somewhere in the middle that's like the the right balance because part of it is how can you know if the work that you're doing is actually having impact if you're not communicating and engaging others around that and getting that validation, getting that conversation, discussion, right? It's actually helpful to do that. So what would you do? What would you suggest to people? anywhere on the spectrum that yeah. want to get ahead, yeah. they feel they're doing meaningful work, but maybe they realize no one's noticing it. How can yeah. they do it? Because I can imagine it could be uncomfortable yeah. to you know, pat yourself it on the is. back. So how can people who are watching this say to themselves, you know what, I should be able to get to the next level. I feel I'm due for it. Do you have like a how-to guide? Yeah, I think part of it is first what I said, there's this kind of like, how do you change your own belief that that's an icky mm -hmm. thing? Right. Because I do think people think it's icky, right? Me talking about myself seems like I'm bragging or blah, blah, blah. So if you can shift your mindset there first, that's the first thing, which is that it's not actually icky to talk about the work. And then if that's a still challenging because that's a new muscle, the other way I would think about it is how can you communicate and engage other people around what you're doing that invites them into it and invites a conversation around it? Because if you can say, Look, I'm not going out to share with Jack and Rick like all this awesome stuff I'm doing on this, you know, project that I have here. But let's say I'm talking to Jack and Rick and I'm saying, hey, here's some of the work that I'm doing. I'm hoping that this helps us get to these goals that our company is outlined is important, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to get your feedback on that. Engage around like what else I could be doing to make this even more impactful for your groups. You could just see how that shifts the conversation because it's actually not all about you it's about other people and bringing them into the work that you're doing in a way that gets them really excited you'll probably get the same result right jackson be like hey christine came to me and she was like she's got this project she's working on and she even wants to know how i'm gonna get you know improvement because of that and blah 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 that shows that she's thinking strategically about this you know all of that is the most important is if you can shift your mindset around how you engage people around your work so that you don't feel like it's a negative thing. Now you can start to see how those conversations can actually help you even do better work. Hey, can I ask you about a branch yeah. of this? What yeah. I see that happens almost all the time is that if you're a contributor and you're doing well, and now you're doing really well, and then you get promoted to management, and then the executive level Executive folks are like, oh, yeah, hey, we're promoting this person. But they just believe because they were a rock star in what they were doing, now they're going to be a great manager. And oftentimes, they're a horrible manager. <laughs> it's like it's like in baseball. <laughs> you could have someone who's a great hitter, you know, great, you know, whatever it might be. But then if they become a manager, they suck at it. They're not good at managing. Right. They're good at, you know, hitting a ball, catching a ball, but they're not good at managing people. Is it me just noticing that? Or is this a thing that you see and maybe you deal with with your leadership program to say, wait a minute, you just uplifted someone to the next level, but what are we doing to make sure that person has the tools to succeed? Is that, yeah. is, is that an issue that you see comes up a lot? <laughs> Jack is why I'm in business, you know, like, <laughs> okay. I mean, so the, the difference is that organizations and even ourselves, we shouldn't have the expectation that just because I'm great at my job, that I'm going to be great at managing and leading a team to do the job because they're inherently different skill sets, especially if you start to look at functional roles, what makes somebody the rock star salesperson could even potentially work against somebody that then has to turn into a player coach, right? Because 
It's not about me going out and signing and closing the next deal, the characteristics it takes to do that. It's about how do I coach others to be able to succeed to do that. The thing that is nice that we've seen at Sounding Board is that you're right. In the past, it was literally like, you know, how many years have you worked here? How long have you done your job? Then now you just naturally progress and you get promoted. And then that's the career ladder that you work. Um, Now I do feel like companies are seeing that they can't just promote somebody into a manager role where they have to lead and run effective teams unless they give them some development and some training, some mentorship. You know, there's lots of different ways companies are going about that. But they have to do that if they want that person to be successful. Not only that, now the stakes are even higher because it's not just that one person's success. It's the entire team's success now rests on that one person. We've certainly seen and have data that's shown that the companies that do that investment see far better results, you know, employee in retention, in promotion rates of people on that team. I do think it's shifting, but yes, I think what you observed is exactly what has been done but hopefully it starts to change. Over the last year or so, we've seen leaders, leadership have been horrible, <laughs> just to put it like, where, you know, layoffs, putting people on pips, just on and on, where from the outside perspective, you're looking at these companies and saying, what are you doing? It's almost like you're torturing your own employees. You're making them feel like every day I have to worry, am I going to be put on a pip? Every day, do I have to worry about the next person who's going to be laid off? And that's a horrible way to live your life. Is there every, like, is there a, a light that's shining on these executives that they have to be accountable to and they have to learn? You're not realizing what damage you're doing to your employees. Maybe you have to do a better job yourself. Is that part of what you do as well? It's hard because when you are at a level where you're earlier in career and these things are happening to you because you're not in the room making decisions about this, it can feel really unfair, right? Like, huh, these are the executives that led us down this path. And then now because sales aren't showing up like we should have or whatever, I'm the person that's on the chopping block because of it. The point of being an executive and a leader is that you have to have accountability and that's accountability for the business and the growth. And that's the CEO. It's my job, right? To make sure that I'm holding my executive leader is accountable. But then I think the question is, is like, if you set that aside and as somebody that's in a company that's going through a lot of these types of changes, what can you do? That's the part where there's always going to be organizational structures that are challenging. And when you have a recessionary environment or a tough economic climate, those things are always going to tighten. So then the question becomes, how do you start to build some of the right tools for yourself, support? Coaching, coping mechanisms, engagement, different things that you do that allow you to still not just get completely crushed by the environment and still be able to do your work, show up, hopefully not get completely burned out. And that's the part where I think coaching and mentoring can be really helpful because if you're able to have outlets for some of those things, ways to find new strategies to make that work, even within the constraints of your environment, it helps you to then equip you to be able to deal with anything that's going to happen down the road. Because I think the reality, Jack, is we have seen now that disruption is happening faster than ever in every company, right? And across the industry, I feel like my job changes every six months. And that does have a downstream impact on my employees as well. So the The most important thing we can do is equip ourselves to be able to deal with that change and then to be able to navigate through that circumstances. Because if you're always a victim to your circumstances, then things aren't going to change for you, right? That's my perspective on it. And I don't know how helpful that is for people, but that's at least what I've found in my own life as the founder and CEO of a company. I feel like every day, every week, I'm just waiting to hear like, what's the new thing that's different this week, right, that I have to deal with or whatever. If I let that guide how I react and how I lead, it would be very challenging. I I would definitely be burned out, but I have to accept what I can and can't control and then give myself tools to be able to manage through that. I appreciate your wisdom and candor. As part of that, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity and go a little bit deeper. You've been an executive and had access to these executive coaching programs, the actual coaches themselves. You know, very few people get that access or get that kind of opportunity. Can you give us a sneak peek into what that looks like? Why might a company, a startup, 
hire these coaches, these executive coaches to work with their leaders? What does a typical session look like? What, what do you all discuss? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great questions. So the reason that my co-founder and I started Sounding Board is because executive coaching is a proven model for very highly personalized development, particularly around leadership skills. Because if you think about it, at the end of the day, a coach is working with you on exactly the areas that you want support around, right? So rather than go to a training program where you're given a standardized curriculum, you're actually coming to your coach with like, hey, I'm really struggling with X. Let's chat through how you can help me get through either a current situation or just this area you've gotten ongoing feedback around that you have to improve. For me, it was communication, communicating across and up. That was one of my challenges, clear communication. The second was then management of my own stress and time so that didn't have an out. Um, word exploding impact on others on my team because I was running a meaningful team at my company. Um, so that's the thing. Executive coaching used to only really be available for the highest level leaders because if you look at that experience, it's highly personalized, right? It's one-to-one. -one. So of course, it's very expensive. And that's really what our vision at Sounding Board was. I got a coach at my last company when I got promoted into executive management. It ended up being this huge unlock for me in terms of helping me close these gaps that I myself hadn't even seen, right? That helped me up level to be able to perform at the level I needed to very, very quickly. So the thought was, why couldn't people access this earlier in their career? Because you, you meet the same types of challenges when you first become a manager. I don't need to be an executive to worry about how I'm going to give and receive feedback improve performance on my team, lead and communicate across the team. Right? I need that even when I'm a first-time manager or not just when I'm an executive. So that was the whole premise for Sounding Board, um, which I started with my coach. Lori, my co-founder, was my coach, and I recruited her to come do the company with me because she had this expertise. Um, and it was to democratize access to coaching because it is just such a powerful model. The challenge is how you scale it in a way that's affordable for more and more people. We do that by delivering it virtually and using technology to automate and scale a lot of the things that a coach does to help us bring down the cost. But I think for folks, then the next question is, okay, then what does that actually look like? How does that actually feel? One of the words that Lori likes to describe is really thinking about your coach as a thought partner. And the difference between, say, a coach and a mentor or a coach and a therapist, you know, which a lot of people will sometimes make those analogies, is that a mentor is often coming to you with advice based off of their own experience. Hey, I did this when I was working at Google. That's why you should do this, right? A therapist might really go backwards to think about the trauma or different things in your life that are causing you to or have created who you are as a person and helping you work through that. A coach is going to come in with a very forward-looking perspective. Okay, here's the challenges you have. What are some actions? What are some things that you can do next that might shift some of that? And then let's come back to that and see what happened and then continue to iterate. But it's a very forward-thinking and then, then it's a questioning driven approach instead of coach saying oh I have all the answers you know why don't you just do what I did when I was at Google it's actually this fundamental belief of like you as a leader have the right answers you probably know what to do but if I can serve as a thought partner to you to help you bring clarity to those options help you think through and articulate what you do it's like the idea of teaching someone to fish versus fish for them because if you can start to shift those mindset that drive the behavior, and you can do that by allowing the person to get to the answer on their own, it's actually much more likely you're able to do that again the next time you face a situation versus having to go back and say like, okay, now what would you do? Because now I've given you a set of tools that help you figure out in the face of uncertainty or stress, like how you start to create clarity, awareness for yourself around what options you might have in front of you. When you mentioned leveraging tech to scale, does that mean that you would have a group function or is that you do one-on-one, -on -one, but it's through virtual technology? How, let's say if I wanted to go to you and say, hey, I need some coaching because I, I'm not a good public speaker. 
So mm-hmm. I get nervous. What should I do? You know, and I need help. Is that how this would all work out? We have lots of different models. So we, our primary model is we sell into a company. A company would buy sounding board and then they can deploy coaching to the leaders. And usually that's very programmatic, right? Maybe you have a manager program and you want everybody in that program after training to get access to a coach. So now they can actually apply what they've learned right? We have that in one-on-one models. We have it in group models. We also have a self-serve model. So imagine if you had leaders that are like, hey, I would really love a coach to help me with X or with Y. It's actually called um, soundingboardinc.com slash accelerate. We call it accelerate because we want every leader to feel like they can accelerate their own development. And you can actually just sign up online and our tech will help you. We have a really cool AI tested and proven algorithm that will match you to the right We have a 96% success rate on a first match. So the tech helps us do everything from matching to scheduling with your coach, tracking your goals, collaborating with your coach, gathering feedback if you want it. But just think about how do you support a virtual interaction or relationship? The tech helps scale all of that. You see places like LinkedIn and other social media sites, you know, every other person is a career coach or something like that. How do you make sure that you break away to say, no, no, we're not doing that. We're doing this. Is that something that creates a little bit of a challenge? It seems like there's so many people out there who says, yeah, pay me such and such, and I'm going to be a coach for you. Yeah, That, that is actually the challenge with the industry overall. Because coaching, unlike, say, therapy or other models, is not regulated in the same way. So you're right. Actually, anybody can call themselves a coach. We call ourselves a managed network versus a marketplace. But similar to them, like an Airbnb, what's our job? Our job is to qualify, vet, manage the coaches to ensure that you get a level of quality, certification, experience. All of our coaches have at least eight plus years of leadership experience. If you come to Sounding Board, it isn't like anybody just hung up a shingle and said that they're a coach. They've been through a very thorough vetting process. And after a coach comes into the sounding board network, we have up to a hundred plus hours of additional continuing education for them to continue to develop them in a community that helps them actually improve in terms of skills as a coach. I love that vetting aspect because I, I think it can just be so hard for folks to go out and find a mentor or a coach or or someone that can actually be genuinely helpful for them. Why is it the industry norm to assume, you know, most companies just assume, well, someone, some other company or some other program is going to give these people the skills and I can just snatch them up and hire them as external (laughs) hires. Why is that the case? Is it just pragmatic cost or is there something behind it? You know, I don't want to go into conspiracy theories, but... (laughs) Is there something there? Because it just seems so pervasive. Well, there is definitely a shift just like in the sense that like, you know, what's you probably know this better than me, you know, what's the average tenure now of an employee within a company? I think last I looked, it was like less than three years, right? Right. Whereas a while back, you used to actually spend five, 10 plus years at one company. And so it was kind of a given that the company is going to be doing the training and development of your management skills because you're going to be there a long time. If they don't do it, you know, they're the ones that are going to be screwed over that fact that the challenge now is what's incentivizing companies to do that when they know that they're only going to have employees for a couple of years. I do think that's where it breaks a little bit because People often, and let's be real, they change jobs because maybe they do get the promotion that they didn't get at their prior company and they get the title and things like that. And at some point, maybe you've titled your way up where people are like, oh, you know what? Rick probably already knows this, right? He's a director or a VP at this company. He's probably already done this before. And then you're like, oh gosh, but I actually never got that formal training because I was moving around or whatnot. So I think it's a function both of employee lifespans at companies now and that shortening, but also it's just the old format of I send somebody off, they learn these skills, and those are going to be the skills that they need. That also doesn't work either because as we've seen, things change so fast. You actually need to be a lot more nimble in terms of how you're developing your team to what the business and the environment currently needs. All of those things make it hard to do well 
right? And you're always trying to balance this investment on tenure and development into a career path within your company. Companies are doing it obviously because they want to retain that talent, but that may not be what happens. That's sometimes at odds. But I think I at least see now that a lot of companies, they come to us and they say, you know, we've got a lot of people we've promoted and They've never gotten any development or training before. And they know that's a gap. They have to close that gap. And that ends up being impetus, actually. And employees themselves in employee surveys, like I need and want learning and development as part of my career path here. It really helps to drive to companies that if they want to retain and they actually want people to be able to do their jobs effectively, they have to make that investment. Do you have an offering for more of the junior people who, let's say the Gen Zs who are starting out to... You know, they're on TikTok with the memes of like bare minimum Mondays and quiet quitting, quitting. And all those kind of stuff. So they're coming in thinking already, like, how can I not do as much work or whatever it may be? But do you offer help for that too, that that group of people? Yeah, the whole premise really is it's development at every mm -hmm. level. In some cases, maybe it is actually about having a mentor internal to the organization because like, you know how this company does things matter, right? This is why people may move companies and while they've been wildly successful at one, they'll go to another one and suddenly, you know, they're at like bottom of the heap. We actually think it's really important for a company to really match right development to right level and needs. The needs has to be what you as an employee need and also what the organization needs because if you don't at least consider those two things, it's hard to make somebody successful, right? You only consider what you as an individual need, but not what's going to make you successful in the organization, that won't work. If you only consider what's needed to be a successful in the organization and you don't care at all about what like Christine personally mm -hmm. need, that won't work either. So it's got to be somewhere in the middle, right? We've seen the companies that can really think about that. You know, maybe it's a group coaching. We've seen group coaching actually work really well for newer managers because part of it is just having a peer group of others, like blind, right? Of course, it, there's a power of connecting with others to know that you have a shared experience. You have shared challenges you're going through. There's somebody else you can talk to in the organization that also understands the nuances, the, you know, annoying things that happen at your company and how you deal with them, right? Then there's power to having that be facilitated by a professional coach that can help you move beyond just venting, but to think about strategies for how you actually start to shift that dynamic. We look a lot at what's the goals that organization has. And then at that level of leader, what's the right developmental experience or program that they should go through. You know, that, that element of shared context is so important, right? Because it can kind of break down if you don't have it, right? Because I, I find that a lot of interpersonal conflicts, they just really come from mismatched expectations. Yes. And they seem to persist, especially in the working world where sometimes stakes might be high, where folks need to hit a milestone or they want to get promoted. It's, you know, more personal to that. I want to kind of Play a dangerous game here and pull up this thread. <laughs> Christine, in your experience and your professional's experience and your coach's experience, are there other common mistakes that folks make when they land their first executive or management role that you often have to coach out or, or really coach to improve? Yeah. Um, and I think it's really relevant for this group because one of the things that we've all heard a lot about is burnout. One of the things that we see a lot, and I was guilty of this myself when I was climbing the ranks, is that as you get into that next level of leadership, one of the biggest things that we are shifting is helping people understand that their job is no longer doing all of the work themselves, but it's how they activate and lead a team to accomplish the goals for the team. But those things are different because the very natural inclination, especially when you first get into manager or first level of higher level leaders is Oh, it's going to be faster if I just do it myself, right? I have to go tell somebody else how to do this, teach them how to do this, take me longer. And guess what? Now there's a big, you know, circle around what's the end output going to be? Is it going to be as good as if I had done it? But the reality is that's not your job anymore to do that work. It's your job to equip and develop others to do that. 
because you're, you actually now have a new job, which is to think at a bigger level about the function. You might have a new job, which is to connect across functions with your peers around how you are achieving other goals for the business. People get um, stuck in this view downwards and they forget the higher up you go in an organization the more you actually have to be looking across, you have to be looking up, you have to be looking forward. And so if all of your time is down into your organization, you're actually not going to be successful. And, and then what happens is if you don't do that, it leads to you basically getting yourself into this rat race of like, oh my God, I just have to keep doing more work. This will never end. And then you do get burned out. Because if you are holding all of that, you actually have already inherited a new job. So unless you can let go of your old job, how are you going to do your new job, right? So it's a very simple idea, but it's hard because we know when you first get promoted up into a leadership role, you want to be successful. And what you probably know is how to do that, right? That's been one of the most common themes that we see. I appreciate that insight. And I really appreciate your, your wisdom and coming on the show. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> It's wisdom, you know. I dyed my hair recently, but it, you know, it's it's been earned over here. Lots of grays and whites, um, only because I've been on the other end. Where you know, I've had people tell me, like Christine, like you have to, that's not being successful for you. And I really just thought I had to work harder. And right. when you're up every night at three a.m. and you just feel so tired and burned out because it feels like it's never ending. You just realize it's not sustainable. So you have to find a way out of it. So that sounds like that's one of the biggest issues that people are dealing with burnout, huh? Yeah, I do think that. And I think um, on the other hand, like the biggest thing we hear from organizations is that they want more strategic leaders. It's like, what does it mean to be strategic? Because I used to hate hearing that word when I was early in career. <laughs> That just me. I talk about what I do, right? But that is the thing that we hear a lot on the organizational side, that they're, they need their leaders to get out of the tactical and they need them to be more strategic, to be really thinking about how they drive the business forward. And it is true. It's because companies are needing more out of their employees earlier in career and across the board, especially if they've restructured. That's often a gap that we have to help the leader themselves understand what that means for the organization and then for the organization to clearly articulate what that means in terms of what they want out of you in terms of behaviors and impact. That's it for the Blind Ambition. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.